operate with a game. Uh, so the first thing is we don't bite, at least not very hard. So you know, if you'd like to come up, that would help. It would make us feel like the room was more crowded mm -hmm. and you were all more interested, which, you know, given our current state of stage fright would be a good thing. Oh, come on, move. Thank you. Yes. See? Yeah. <laughs> Give over. yourself a round. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Reg Chua. I'm with Thomson Reuters. It doesn't matter what I do because I'm just moderating. Uh, <laughs> the real people here are Juliana Rufus from Al Jazeera English and Ivan uh, Giordano from Altera. Altera Studios. Yeah. Altera Studios. Um, today, as a special treat, you get, uh, you get two panels for the price of one. Uh, we are going to talk about the, uh, this great piece of interactive storytelling, which they will do, and I will watch and listen, uh, and then we'll, uh, and we'll talk about that. And then we also wanted to have a broader discussion about the role and practicality of building gaming elements uh, into stories. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to both of them to do uh, to, to show what they've done, which, uh, as we had a short discussion yesterday, I guess we're calling it an interactive storytelling In with gaming elements, as opposed to a Yeah, I, I think we should actually pick up on that in, in the discussion mm -hmm. later on, right. um, because uh, I'm quite keen not to call it a game, but an interactive investigation for reasons that we can discuss, discuss later, <laughs> uh, but with gaming elements. Okay, yeah. so, um, and the other, other thing I would say which, uh, which, I, which surprised me uh, when we talked about this yesterday um, was that, uh, in fact, many of the interactive elements were, in fact, all built after the fact and were not integrated uh, into the, uh, the actual filming um, and production. So bear that in mind as you uh, walk through. So, over to you. Thanks. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, basically what I want to do, and I, I hope you will appreciate that re this because you're an investigative audience, um, I want to talk through the story that we filmed first. Um, so I, there, there will be no revelations at the end of what happens because what I want to do is focus on the actual process of turning, of making this project interactive. Um, so it's a film that I set out to do three years ago for Al Jazeera English, for People in Power, um, and we were investigating illegal fishing in, um, in Sierra Leone. Um, and as you probably know, illegal fishing destroys the livelihood of local fishermen, they're, they're the breeding ground of fish get destroyed, uh, and the country use, loses revenue. And in this case, we were tracking down South Korean trawlers who were fishing illegally inside the inshore exclusion zone, the protected area. And it was a truly amazing shoot, and I sort of sometimes worry that this will never happen in my life ever again. Um, because within two weeks, we managed to do an investigation from beginning to end, and I'm sure you all know how, diff how near impossible that is. We filmed two pirate illegal trawlers who had their identities disguised, their names hidden, their markings disguised. Um, we managed to take photographs of the crew members, um, as you can see. Um, we also took a GPS reading um, to be able to prove that these ships were fishing inside the inshore exclusion zone. Um, and then we embarked, after we'd caught these illegal trawlers, we um, embarked on the investigation to find out who they really were. We went into Freetown Port, filmed and photographed uh, Korean trawlers coming in, then tried to compare the photos of the trawlers to our footage. We spoke to uh, whistleblowers both in the Sierra, Leone Sierra Leonean Fishing Ministry um, and also in the Navy. Um, and in the end, um, amazingly, we found the ship um, and actually managed to do what you could call a citizen's arrest and, and yeah, found the catch. So, um, uh, yeah, and I'll come to the results later. So, so that's the story. So actually, the interactive project um, started four years ago um, at the last investigative conference in the Ukraine. I don't know who was there, but when um, I actually met Julia Rubino, who's sitting over there in the audience. Um, and we started brainstorming about um, interactive projects, and we felt that um, it would be great to make an investigation interactive because um, what you have in an investigation is a collection of evidence, and that's a process that that lends itself to interactivity. Um, we had a number of goals um, in order to doing that, and then um, Julia very kindly introduced me to Ivan, who's got a production company, Altera Studio in Rome, and um, it'll, well, you'll see the result. 
Um, but what were the project goals? What we wanted to do, we wanted to show to people how an investigation really works um, on the inside. And you, of course, know that, but most people who watch our work in films and films and, and so on don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. We also wanted to take investigations outside the area of people, the audience of people who normally consume it. You know, we quite often, I feel, we, we speak to each other as investigators or as journalists, and we were very much thinking um, about how do you reach younger audiences? Um, you know, how do we take it out of the Guardian, away from only Al Jazeera, um, in, yeah, towards new audiences? And then also we just wanted to pass on the buzz of an investigation because, you know, we're all buzzing when we do our work. Um, so, so here you go. That's the page that you get to when when you click um, our interactive investigation, um, and you get an email, which you click on, um, and then you realise you're taking the role of a junior investigator. Um, you get and pause for a second. you get a message from your editor, and your editor is basically saying. Can you please join an investigative team in Sierra Leone to, um, uh, to investigate pirate fishing? And you hopefully accept. Um, and then the next screen uh, th that you get is, is an explanation of how it's going to unfold, and I'll talk you through it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so this is, normally you have a flow. The problem is I'm trying to introduce a kind of interactive um, project in a linear style, but you get to know your team via mobile phone, which is our device. Um, we alert you to the fact that you have a mission control. I'll come to all of that. And then you get to the first video where we're actually setting out, we're following up. Um, can you pause again for a second? Um, so, so we have a team and this is, of We're course, the screen. Uh, this reflects what happened on location. We have a team that consists of um, myself and, and a filmmaker, Orlando von Einsiedel, who's uh, since made Virunga, quite famously. Uh, we have two local Sierra Leonean counterparts, without whom the whole thing would have never taken off. One, Amara, who works for an NGO, who managed to get all the local information on sightings of trawlers and um, somebody called Victor, who works for the fisheries ministry and um, uh, who sort of joined us not quite officially because he was an honest guy in the fisheries ministry and um, he came along with us and, and we were trying to actually work out his role during the whole uh, production, wh whether, you know, wh whether he, he could genuinely help us um, uh, bust the trawlers because there was a lot of corruption on top of the fisheries ministry. So we set out, and this is the very first clip that you get to, in a little speedboat because we're following up on rumors that illegal trawlers have been sighted. What happened? Yes. They, are, they are destroyed our materials, our fishing gears, hooks, nets. Oh. And when do they leave? In the morning? Yeah, in the morning. So they feel safe at night? Yeah. At night, they come very close to the shore. They caught it. This is caught? Yeah. They destroyed 700. Now this the balance of 100. It was 800 hooks. This is the bit that's left, yeah. and everything else is lost. Yeah, yeah. 700 lost on this. They are fishing several times with no catch because of harassment of the trawler. The Israel fishing here, they were fishing by the trawlers. So now we have no fishing. Somebody just called me from Mania trying to give a report on this trawler. That this morning, he saw it set into this point, the guys are seeing. So does that mean the trawler is fishing now? Yeah, they are fishing down there. Illegally? Well, I can say illegally. You have to check. You yeah, have to check. Okay, 
Okay, so this happens at the end of every clip. Um, as, as you've seen during the clips, we have little icons that come up in the top right-hand corner. Um, and, and then basically what you get at the end of the clip, you get these cards and you can click on them. And um, when you do so, you see what information we have gathered. Tim. Yeah. Um, so for example, this explains the inshore exclusion zone. Then uh, the next one is the destroyed net. And what we're asking you to do is to actually drag and drop um, these images to the right hand side, to um, to the bar on the right-hand side and to distinguish between evidence, between notes, and between backgrounds. So what we're passing on to the user is what we actually have to do as journalists. We have to build up criminal evidence to make sure our investigation sticks, but we also have to collect information because without information we can't plan our next steps. Um, and un understand how the investigation works. So, so this is actually the key gamified element um, that, that we're using in it. And then within that, um, as, as we'll get to, I mean, um, you, you, you can score points and I'll come to that. So if we watch the next clip, um, I'll just show you how this then plays out, this collection of evidence um, when, we find, when we get to the trailers, uh, trawlers. So this is Victor from the Fisheries Ministry. Take okay. a snapshot of any of the fishermen on board, which would be an evidence that uh, this was the boat. They're really pulling up the net, huh? So we can see it when it comes out? Okay. They've covered up the marking, but we can still see the name quite clearly. It's the Sea Queen. Okay, so you see how it unfolds when we actually find the trawlers. You, you see exactly what evidence we gather. You can you know, unfold and drag and drop it. So, so on the right-hand side, and, and the idea is don't just watch, um, be actively involved in the investigation, unlike a documentary. Um, and then we have the status bar on the right-hand side. Um, and these are more gamification elements. So, for example, what we do, classic gamification tool, we give you an indication of where you are. You can see the progress, stage one, two, three, and four. Um, you also, through dragging and dropping, you, you gain points, investigative points. Um, we tell you how many points you need to get to the next status. And then um, you can also explore the map for extra content. And by doing that, you get badges, which you can post on Facebook. Um, and then obviously all your share elements, um, as you get with all interactive media. Um, and then keep playing. And then this is what it looks like when you finish the stage and you advance from junior, um, junior researcher, and in the end you have the potential to stage four as a senior investigative reporter. You get healthcare at that point. <laughs> Free healthcare. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, so, so we have a mixture of you. You've seen the clips, um, and 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 as you scroll down through all of this, you get to what we call interactive environments. And in this case, it's the local office of the Environmental Justice Foundation um, in in southern Sierra Leone. And here we give you the option uh, to decide where you want to go next. Um, so yeah, we called it a virtual environment and basically you can click on, on the various options that we give you to see what you, um, what you want to do next. And the thing that you really have to do in this case, um, plot on the map um, to see if the trawler really take the trawler coordinates and make sure they find out on the map if the trawler was really illegally in the inshore exclusion zone, um, which will then play the next clip that does that. And if you've done all of that, you get to the end of um, stage one. So I sort of hope that gives you an impression of how we used the clips and, and the gamification elements that we introduced. Um, that actually, conceptually, came later and, and was the relatively easy bit. Um, the, the really big, big problem that we had was structural. 
Um, we knew we wanted to do a web doc and we had looked at a lot of other web docs and web documentaries. And what was different about ours, um, because it is an investigation, we wanted a beginning, a middle and an end. And if you are familiar with web docs, you probably will know that most of them have not got a linear narrative. Um, somebody described them to me as all-you-can-eat buffets. Um, but what they do, they present um, information, characters, uh, and so on, either on a timeline that you can decide what year, what time, whatever you want to view things by, Gaza Serrot does that, or by location where you can go on a map and click content, or by character. Um, so character, time, map are the three normal ways in which information is organized. So. Um, we wanted to maintain a linear structure within it, and we had a massive problem, um, because we wanted to give the user freedom, but we also needed to get, get, um, keep control over the narrative, because we have to take you somehow from the beginning to the end. And I cannot tell you, and Ivan will say a bit more, how many versions we went through to resolve yeah. this contradiction. Um, uh, what we came up with, and um, with, with the whole team, is that we organized uh, everything in four stages, so uh, the first two stages, um, well, the first one is interactory, introductory, when we find the trawlers and collect most of the evidence. Then we have two investigative stages, and then we have the resolution in stage four. What we have done is that we combined classic elements of scroll journalism, and I mean, all of this is quite hard sort of to repeat in the presentation, but it'll take you three minutes when you're on it, where you scroll down. So basically, this is where you have no freedom. We make you go one way. Um, we combine scroll journalism with clips, the interactive environments where we give you freedom, and gamification. So we use a number of elements to do that. Um, and yeah, Ivan will say a little bit more um, about the design of that if I give him his notes. <laughs> yeah, um, you should have an email, I just forward you another one. Uh, check with them um, on your Google account, because I forward it to... Okay. It's, it's not a link, it's just into the mail. Sorry, commercial <laughs> break. <laughs> okay. I will start with um, um, a brief video that uh, shows the. Um, I don't have. Okay, I have. Uh, that shows the design of the pirate fishing. So we can see we have different elements of design and we try to do um, a nice interaction between foreground and background. What we try to do is to, uh, to have a background that is uh, not just a frame but uh, something that gives to you information and we'll see this later. Um, gives to you, to the user, the opportunity to go very quickly forward the story, if he wants. So we have devices, we have video backgrounds, we have virtual environments, and each of these um, elements gives to you a piece of information. There is nothing that is only um, because it's uh, beautiful to see. This is an introduction video to the last part of our investigation. And we see another virtual environment. Um, I will spend just a couple of minutes to, uh, to explain um, the model of uh, narration we, we, uh, we did. Um, actually, the final model we arrived, um, the model you can see, consists in a form of combination between um, two big models we assumed at the very beginning of this uh, production uh, adventure. 
the first one was a crossroad story, and the second, a deconstructed story. These are two models that we took from other examples of web documentary. Um, I would call the result, uh, that is this combination, the elastic story. In this case, the user experience tries to emulate the journalistic work, and the user is encouraged to collect and file information during the investigation. Um, in this model, there is uh, not locked contents, and this is very important because um, we tested that locked content um, was a problem for user experience. A lot of people lived the product. Um, even if there is some Easter egg uh, hidden somewhere that um, clever <laughs> user can find. Um, the flow of the plot is arranged in a linear way and is given to the user in a multimedia stream with graphics, text, clip, background videos, uh, virtual devices, and virtual environments. So that even the user who, who quickly scroll the page in a few minutes have all the necessary info. Um, some of the, context, the contents are still notes. Uh, so if you want, you can stop the time and explore. For example, um, exploring the map. Um, they are virtual environments, key place of the story, and as I said, the maps. Uh, one of the great advantages of, of this model, uh, in my opinion, is that from a uh, user experience point of view, um, it is a model that is not too far, it is quite similar to some social network stream user experience model, so users are um, easy to use it. Um, without losing the story, user can decide how to use the story. So five minutes during a work break, and he will have all the necessary information to go to the end. Or 40 minutes if you want to explore all the content. Um, user can scroll quickly, he can stop on single elements, and if he wants, he can interact. Um, well, the risk of this kind of fruition is that the, um, oh, this kind of, oh, the risk of this model is that the fruition is too fast. So we try to stimulate the time of use and user interaction with two elements that Julian already spoke. Um, these two elements are gamification, uh, gamification elements, and exploration opportunities, and for two kind of user, different user. Um, now I will say just something very quick about the production workflow. Um, when we started this work, um, we had a problem um, because there is no business and production model for this kind of stuff. Uh, for this, we decided not to follow our standard workflow. And our standard workflow is design, then produce, then we receive user feedback, and then we work. So um, we worked on this with, uh, uh, what I'd say, uh, an organic workflow, having the design phase along the most of the production, um, and letting the user feedback change the very structure of the product. This model was, um, this model that was more difficult in terms of organization of work gave us more creative freedom and the precious opportunity uh, to fine tune the product design during the production according live to user feedback. And one last thing about the people we needed to do this. Um, we, needed, we needed quite a big crew, uh, these are the departments. We had production and creative direction with me and my colleague David Lemma. David Lemma. We, uh, we had um, journalist precious journalistic support with uh, Giulio Rubino. Uh, we had all the audio video crew with um, video editing and VFX. And then we had, we had a huge work on sound design and I would really, I really think that sound design is a key point in this kind of product. And then, of course, we have all the work of illustration and graphic design. We were um, more or less 10 people working on it. OK, that's all. Um, so do we have the crew members before? The crew members? 
Anyway, yeah. So, so just to sort of take you towards the end of the story, because we wanted to make quite a lot of room for Q&A we discussed yesterday so that you can ask us, but that we can also see um, what other ideas there might be out there to gamify or, or make investigations interactive. In terms of what happens next in the story, we um, found the trawler eventually in, in, um, in Freetown Port, and it, it was really all quite dramatic. I mean, what we did, we went to the fisheries minister, um, we presented him with our investigation, and we said, minister, minister, look, there is a crime, and we have the evidence, and he sent us away, and then we were being a pain, and we went again, and in the end, he said, okay. I mean, we basically said, this film is going out on Al Jazeera. You know, do you want to be part of the solution or not? And he said, oh, can I think for one night? And then he thought for one night and said, come back, come back, we, you know. Um, we're calling the ship in, and he arranged for the Navy to take us out um, uh, to take us out to the trawler for an inspection. But we arrived at the point, um, having worked a lot on, on Navy corruption, we got to the meeting point with the Navy a little bit early, and we actually saw them take off and go out to the trawler, <laughs> probably to give them a warning. <laughs> so we then organized um, uh, a boat ourselves, a little speedboat, and with Victor, who from the fisheries ministry, who by that time had a very clear mandate to help us, um, we boarded the plane and Victor just loved what was happening next because as you can see he was pulling out the photos that we were taking and he went up to, this is the crew member we photographed earlier on and said, that's you, right? That's <laughs> you. Um, and then the next thing is when we um, go to the captain and he makes the captain look at the positions of the ship and we find that they've actually been erased. Um, and, um, and then came or, you know, the thing that we were hoping for most, because we didn't know if they had transhipped or not, but we climbed down, and this was quite dramatic, into the cool room with everybody standing above us, and we found the catch, and they didn't close the hatch um, on us. We came out again. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so the result of the investigation, um, um, as you can see here, we tell you at the end of um, the web doc, I mean, for me personally, as a journalist, this was really gratifying because um, uh, it was the first time that trawlers um, were fined in Sierra Leone. Um, the, the two ships actually were telling the story of one ship, but it was two that we, we busted. Um, they were fined, they paid some of it, um, but the entire fleet of, um, of um, South Korean trawlers um, temporarily left Sierra Leone um, alone. They went to other African countries. Um, <laughs> so the livelihood of the fishermen went up and uh, um, recovered, yeah, all of which was gratifying. Um, uh, so that was the result of the uh, documentary, but the result of the, sorry, the re yeah, result of the film, but the result of the interactive uh, project when we released it, it got quite a lot of media attention um, because it was probably the first interactive gamified investigation in the world. Um, nobody's yet told us over the past year that this is not the case. Um, Al Jazeera was incredibly happy because uh, we reached over 80% of a new audience. So when we you know, looked at, um, at who was on it, um, th these were all first-time visitors to the Al Jazeera website, um, you know, which is great for the broadcaster. Um, and then the thing that we'd never thought about, which was again, sort of, I think for us, very gratifying, um, that suddenly was taken up by journalism teachers around the world. Um, like in the US, the um, Journalism Educators um, Alliance, I think they're called with several thousand members, and it's actually being used in classrooms uh, to teach journalism and fact-finding in investigative journalism now, obviously, you know, not at this level, at a m for much um, younger students. Um, but that's obviously uh, great for us too. Um, we didn't do so well on engagement, we have to be honest about that. Um, uh, I, d I, I honestly don't know how long we kept, because Al Jazeera didn't put that many markers, um, but we sort of anecdotally know that people didn't stay on it as long as we would have liked them to. Um, so that's room for improvement there. Um, and then we, you know, Ivan was talking about the little Easter eggs um, um, that were hidden throughout the project. 
Um, do you want to put the last screen in, in the video? One of the things that we did is I have a friend in Sierra Leone who runs a production company um, where um, she teaches former combatants um, to make music videos and, and, and songs. And we um, had a competition and um, we got people to do the, the title track for pirate fishing. And the condition that we had is that you have to cut a video from the footage in the film, you have to listen exactly to what the video says and that needs to be your lyrics. And this is what came up. Can we have some volume? Now we see stop, stop the illegal fishing. Send us a fisherman, you don't spot the fishes in my country. Now we see stop, stop the illegal fishing. Send us a fisherman, you don't spot the fishes in my country. Oh yeah, na na na. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Anyways, I feel good right we'll get to there. Attention to some of the things I'm gonna mention here. Though some of you raised from Ajekule, never mind the experience they said to these present days. I raised from the slum, now I'm heading to the front. My eyes have seen things, including corruption of illegal fishing, ocean tree, sea queens. Always come to a cell, Shabu Island, to be precise, to do. Pirate fishing at night, they switch their lights off and do it quick like married secrets Because of less securities, goes cut free Like a man with sneaky, heavy hair, Sierra Leone is losing 25 million dollar year You still preaching about peace, let me see the law Where some international country can it fix a lot United Nations, can it speak your world, you can't into the fact That means it's a lot oh. Anyway, so, so these were the winners of the competition and um, <laughs> <laughs> a great and wonderful engagement with the, with the video and all. So look, I, I have tons of questions. I guess I would start with the, with the simplest ones, which I think people are eager to hear. Time, cost, uh, replicability, how hard was it to do? What would you have done differently um, now that you know? And how many more of these can you churn out in, you know, how much time? Um, I get time. Uh time and cost uh, cost it, it was it was really really cheap um, we, we did it very cheaply it actually in some ways was a labor of love we pitched it to Al Jazeera and um, I th think they probably didn't quite understand what we wanted to do but found it interesting and I, I know my boss said to me okay you can do this as long as it doesn't impact on your day job um, and that's literally <laughs> what happened <laughs> um, so all of us um, Julia included and also Ivan um, we spend a lot of time working evenings, weekends, and um, as Ivan said, the work process was agile, so we kept um, redesigning and getting feedback. Um, so doing this as a sort of virtual labor of love, I mean, for which there you know, was obviously some payment, um, it, it took about over a year. Yeah. But if you hadn't done it, full, if you had done it more full time, how long would it have taken? If we work full time on this, well, uh, I would say that uh, we have worked full time on this, um, it would have taken um, more or less three months, something less than three months. But uh, in these three months, there is also the time of creating the model. Mm -hmm. So we have other two web docs that actually are still online on our <laughs> servers that are very different from this one. So we, in three times, we did three. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's a point. Uh, now that we have uh, a more uh, uh, precise idea of what is the web doc uh, that fits for pirate fishing investigation, it will have taken, uh, mm. of course, mm, less time. And, and the thing that, that I found really interesting was that, you know, as I say, when I first went through this, I thought, obviously, you had planned this whole thing out, and, and it turns out you hadn't. Um, how different would it be if you had planned it out? How, what would you have done differently and how would you do something differently now if you planned this to go with that? Personally, I think um, it may not be desirable, but there is actually quite a lot of potential to, to reversion something if you have an investigation. You can, you can come at it later and, and turn an existing project into something interactive and gamified. But I think had we done it from the beginning, definitely 360-degree 300, footage. There, there are really simple things that, that we could have done to make th th this more interactive. The dance, maybe. Hmm? Some the dance. Yeah, oh yeah, that's another thing that we uh, did because when Orlando and I were making the film, 
Um, we didn't obviously, we didn't know when we, when we would find the real trawler. So we just rolled. We rolled on everything because every moment in, in, in these um, nearly two weeks um, could have been the breakthrough in our story. So it was nearly observational filming, even though it was current affairs. So we integrated some dead ends in, in this because we wanted to show the user that if you're a journalist, an investigative journalist, probably 90% at least in my case, <laughs> uh, of my time is, is spent on trying something that doesn't work. And, and what gets you to the goal is not giving up. Um, so, so more of that, working with that more creatively, the, the dead ends on location, as Ivan said. What else would yeah. you say? Uh, from my personal perspective, uh, user experience point of view, I would say that um, we should, if I will do this again, I should arrange the video in a different way to make it a little bit shorter. Yeah. And, and what about just in terms of the way you would have structured the story? Because you said, you know, there was a lot of thinking about how you would structure the story. How would you go into, obviously not the, not the investigation itself, which is sort of a, a process, but as you were, if you like, writing it or creating and editing it, how would you have thought about the structure? Would you have, you know, much more clearly gone to a structure like this? I mean, as you were saying, you, you had some difficulties in trying to integrate mm. two types of structure together. I think that's... A, a contradiction of the heart of an interactive project. If, okay. if, if you want a beginning, middle and end, any, anything you do, you will have the contradiction between right. control over the narrative and freedom to the user. Th that will not ever go away and right. you'll just have to live with it. I, but I think, uh, I mean, I, and I don't know, this is now a year that we've com completed it and uh, this world is obviously moving very quickly. I think even though this isn't half as fancy as some of the other projects out there, this still falls in the, into the category of the sort of bigger, chunkier um, web docs. And, and I think, personally, what I would find interesting now is not to give up on that, but you obviously need a lot of resources, time and money for something like that. But, but if you look at the statistics on how um, content is being used, um, two-thirds of contents are consumed on mobile phones, and 86% and of that via, via apps. So for me, the really interesting next challenge would actually be, can you develop um, an interactive investigation app um, for a mobile phone? Uh, and how cheap can you make it? Because in terms of getting money, even though this wasn't expensive and, and is replicable, uh, really you want to go to, to a funder and say $20,000. Um, and, and the thing with an app is you, you can have replicable technology. <laughs> um, I couldn't say replicable today. last had, night, so I practiced. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, the, the key to all of this really is replicable technology. Yeah, I agree with what Juliana said, and I'd say that what uh, we should absolutely, what I should absolutely keep up this product is the balance between um, going forward and staying on an hub of information. And what I think is that in this kind of business, each story has its own balance. And if you produce a model that can be elastic and be more straightforward to the end or more, uh, more explorative, uh, that is, uh, in my opinion, a good business model. So you can uh, change it and balance to each investigation. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the the gamification elements that you put in. As you say, you had the you know stages; people could see that they you know they got points, they got healthcare after a while. Um, how <laughs> next much? Next one. Yes, next one. Uh, then they get laid off in the third one. Um, what's the? Uh, how much research do you do into sort of the gaming elements? How many things dropped out along the way? How much play testing did you do to see you know what worked and what what didn't work? I'll, shall I start with the City University and then you, because you put it into, pr okay. The, 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 the really big moment for me in all of this was when we had a beta version um, and, and I took it to City University in, in London who have a very prestigious MA international journalism course with um, 90 to 100 students from around the world um, who've all, most of them have already been practicing journalists, um, very opinionated and I, I got them to, to test the beta version. And they trashed it. <laughs> they, they came back and they said, you know, why do you give, up cho give us choices when you already know what the outcome is? You know, um, you know who, who will take that? But they asked all the right questions. Test. It was hard. I felt quite beaten when I came out. And then I rang up um, Ivan and said, look, this was the feedback. 
Um, but and, and we both decided they were right, and that was on, a, on an earlier version. Yeah. And then came, that was sort of slightly pre-gamification. Yeah, uh, well, I, I'd say that uh, um, this version is simple, no? and mm. its simplicity is a result. Uh, previous versions were more, com more complicated the, from a user experience point of view. And there is, I have to say, uh, I'm a little bit of a nerd, so uh, I like complex computer stuff. So uh, I was very sad about <laughs> let go <of> some <laughs> feature that we were working on. It's like uh, editing. Yeah. Um, so look, I, I know there's questions uh, from the floor. I want to get some, but I also want us to, you know, hopefully get into some broader questions about gamification. But um, we have a question over there. Yes, sir. Hello, my, my name is Martin Stenhoff. I work for the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, do you have plans for uh, footage from Sierra Leone into the game after you left? Is there any possibility? Did you think about having local content adding on to the game after you left? Because I believe the situation, maybe it's changed, maybe it's not. Are there any options? Did you think about that to get more interactivity with the people who is there and not by the computers? What we thought about, and it was incredibly painful to let this go, is one of the things that I learned um, during the whole investigation is that th there is no uh, central, um, centralized uh, tr tracking uh, registration for ships, and it's incredibly easy for ships to sh change names and so on. And obviously, we learned a lot during the investigation about uh, the, the necessity of, of having photos to track down trawlers. Um, we, we didn't really think, I mean, the EJF is doing that, but um, and collecting very efficiently um, more footage and evidence from Sierra Leone. But what we wanted to do is have a follow-up uh, website and managed by the EJF, the Environmental Justice Foundation, because as a broadcaster, we couldn't have done it, where we would have said to people who watch it and said, right, now you've learned everything you need to know about, well, or you've learned something about how you track illegal trawlers. Um, what we need you to do is to go out into ports of the world um, and, and, and photograph trawlers because we need a database. Um, so, so that was really the, the big idea off the back of the uh, project because we felt that especially youth audiences are interested in politics, they are interested in, in, in investigations, but they want to be empowered and they want to participate. Um, and rather than just churning stuff out them, we wanted to give them the opportunity to participate. But as, as we all know, you know, going into Mombasa port, for example, and taking photos is their liability issue if you ask people to do that and it's not always safe. But, but the initial vision was to, to, have, um, to, to have a phase two where, where people can help investigate. Hi, um, I'm Laura, for a multimedia editor from Canada. Um, and I was really interested in your user testing. We're just starting to try and do that. How far in advance of publication did you start user testing? And then my second question is, uh, did you have custom link tracking within the interactive to know what people clicked on? Uh, yeah, to, to go back, because I think, I really think, Al Jazeera gave us the money, but they hadn't quite gotten they had around it, so we didn't really have a deadline, <laughs> um, which is why it also became a labor of love. So, you know, I, mean, I think we all know the sort of the blessing and the curse of not having a, a deadline. <laughs> um, but we didn't have one. We just sort of really did user testing, I think, partly when we hit a brick wall and when we thought it was necessary. We have a first user testing uh, after one month and one half in the very, uh, oh, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. no? And then uh, th that was a structured uh, user test. Uh, then we, have, we had several non-structured user mm -hmm. tests along the production, along the most of the production. And then we had uh, a classical final um, feedback and rework session before the we published the, the web doc. Good afternoon. Muturai Alaka is my name. I work with the Wally Shrinker Center for Investigative Journalism in Nigeria. Um, it really interests me what you did with entertainment, with telling the story, um, because I work with a media organization that also is an, a nonprofit. The challenge between um, reporting and moving it to a point where you can advocate for those issues 
So I want to learn more about how you were able to get to that point where you used entertainment and you got the people to actually hone the story. Because when the people hone the story, then it's easier to get change on the street, which is, should be the ultimate aim of, of a report. So how did you get to that point where you were able to get those children to get involved, sing a song that tells the story of corruption, point out that it, they can dance to it, but it also sends the message across? Um, really, that was in some ways because I knew Hazel Chandler, who's doing this work in Sierra Leone. We are friends for a long time. And, and, and I love what she's doing because she's sort of got a lot of people together who otherwise live on the street. And she's really, you know, got them up to scratch in terms of video production and so on. So we just decided um, to ask them to run a competition. It was quite amazing, the different songs that came in. So it came out of a personal connection. Uh, it didn't go that far because it actually then clashed with the onset of the Ebola crisis. Um, so we had Sierra Leonean broadcasters interested in the song and we actually thought this would popularize everything a lot more in Sierra Leone, but the timing was just not right. Let me, let me ask a quick follow-up question, just in terms of, I guess, engagement, what do you think people took away from it? And, and I know you, you didn't, or I don't think you did do any sort of serious research around this, but you know, the, the notion of the, the kids getting involved with the song clearly brought something to them that they wouldn't have had just watching the video. Uh, the people who wa just watched the documentary versus the people who played the game, if you like. Um, what do you think their takeaways, or what, what, what was each one good for, if you like? What was the, you know, what, what was the, uh, the, the, the information, communication strategy, I guess, behind all of these, or, or what do you think the takeaways were? Take your time, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, personally, I really feel we're at a time, and I would love if people know differently, but we're really at a time of trial and error. Um, so we, we just try to have the best possible ideas and we cross our fingers and hope that they work. <laughs> um, because uh, as you know, Ivan was saying about the business model, um, th this is all really quite new. Um, it's, it's the school thing that really, I think, where the biggest impact was and, 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 you know, they were forced to do it to the end. <laughs> so <laughs> there we have proper engagement. But they were probably, I hope, also quite grateful because it was a more entertaining thing in the classroom. Uh, but I would bear that in mind, actually. Can you, without being didactic in future, can something be a teaching tool? Um, but don't make it one. But not but broccoli. <laughs> you don't want to make people <laughs> exactly. eat their broccoli. <laughs> Hi, my name is Karen. I'm from China. And I think the gamification element is really in, um, interesting. So I wonder, like, um, if someone wants to, like, to um, make similar uh, stories using gamification, uh, what kind of suggestions do you have? And uh, what kind of stories do you think will be, like, suitable for this game? There's, there's a really good book out, um, uh, News Games, which you can get, and that's, that's actually got a, a nice bit of, of things. And strangely enough, if you go to Wikipedia, which I did this morning because I was doing research, uh, there is actually a, a whole section on News Games, and it walks you through. So, uh, Which game elements? Um, well, one key point to me is uh, if you uh, try to have some uh, user time, one key point is uh, to give uh, control to the user of the time is given to you. So um, simple tools uh, that um, tell you which part of an investigation uh, you are in, uh, like a progress bar, are, um, are very, very important. Um, they are simple, but very important. Um, then you have um, the competition, um, the competition tools that are more expensive to uh, to realize, but uh, they are really, really important. So uh, uh, if you ask to do the people uh, something very simple, but this something, um, this simple thing, uh, you can compare it with uh, their uh, friends on Facebook are doing, uh, that is a goal. And then uh, it's very useful to have um, different levels. And uh, in my opinion, um, it could be also uh, shaped in a way um, different levels are um, the more and more difficult. Because uh, when we, we did this user test, um, 
there was something that was too complicated. For example, at, at the point we had uh, a virtual computer. So you go into the virtual computer, you have uh, mandatory content that unlock other content, and then you you go to the to the final clip, and that was fun. But was fun for a, it was very fun for uh, a few people, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> was not fun at all for a lot of people. But uh, if you can. Um, um, make this as a more difficult level. In my opinion, it's very, it will be very effective. There's, there's really sort of three types of things, right? I mean, one is giving people information that they can glom onto, like a status bar, and or even you know, simple quizzes and so on. You completed yeah. three, you completed five. It really doesn't matter sometimes, mm -hmm. but it just gives you a sense of a, of a level. The other one is sort of trying to do a directed thing. When, when we did Connected China and before that Who Runs Hong Kong, we had this huge interactive database and we found that people got lost. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we wanted to do, which we never did, was to just put up little quizzes. Who is the most connected person? Yeah. Who, you know, can you find this person? Mm -hmm. It just gives you a goal and, and uh, you know, a feeling that you might find something. And then I think the third one, which is the more complex one, is where you actually build a simulation of a system like the, uh, the Wired Somali uh, uh, pirates game or the or the sweatshot game where you're trying to explain a system to people and that one's far more complicated. Can I actually say yes? Because, yeah, I, th I think there is. A, I think it also depends on the story. I mean, I've just done a film about hacking and um, and we, you know we've been brainstorming about doing actually a phone app where you investigate hacking and you gather evidence, but you've got to do it without being hacked. Um, so you have to be careful what you accept and you base that on you know, how you get hacked on your laptop, you have to spot stuff. So it depends on the story. But I think the really important thing is, and we talked about that last night, and it keeps coming up, and I had that with Al Jazeera. I think, personally, I feel like we really have to stay away from calling something a game, because the game yeah, industry has so much money. It's a multi-billion industry. There is no way we can compete. I think what we can do is we can make interactive journalism with gamification elements. And that's what we carefully think about. But if, uh, personally, I feel if we try and make games, um, I mean, we can do, like, I, I, I quite like Sweatshop, which is so small and funky, but personally, I feel we set ourselves up for failure. I have to say I really agree with Juliana. If we try to do a, a real game, uh, I think we, we will, the risk of fail is very high, because. Do you call me a gamer? Sorry. Oh, you, 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 have to, you have to wait for the Sorry. mic. Right? Sorry. I'm Anthony from Bangkok. Um, are you personally like gamers? Do you have any particular games that influence you? I More mean, you. LA Noir, Watch Dogs. Uh, well, uh, I like it very much Watch Dogs, but <laughs> no. I mean, it's more like yeah, yeah, thing yeah. 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 But um, uh, I would say from the very beginning, uh, I, I tried not to be influenced by. Um, we tried not to be influenced by uh, video games because they are too much complex and the, the user experience it's very deep and that um, that user experience it's very very expensive um, but we studied uh, the web documentaries that uh, were currently online at the time we started this project so we had a um, precise idea of what was web documentary at that moment and we tried to implement something uh, like a game into that model that later changed, as I told before. Other questions? Hi, I'm Manolo from Italia, and um, I've been playing this. Um, I, I really loved it. I, I went through it, I became, I, I got my health insurance. <laughs> I made it. So I really love it through and um, really made me think a lot about how to use my work. I'm a filmmaker myself, so we're going to be in contact. But cool. there is something that, so going snooping inside, I went to the um, YouTube uh, window of, of, each, uh, um, of each clip, and I noticed that the views are really low, like 40, 47 views. So that means that people uh, didn't really, you know, when they saw. Yeah, so how, how do you, did you, did you notice that? And what, what is the reaction you have on knowing that people will have a, a very superficial uh, view of this and doesn't really go inside? I, mean, I was really surprised because I was expecting, you know, 
thousands of views. And say it was like, mm, so I don't know, if you notice that, obviously, I guess, <laughs> and, uh, what is the outcome you know, of, of this? Um, I mean, I, 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 I was told by Al Jazeera we had <laughs> thousands of views, but I mean, it's not as much as we were hoping for, for sure. So that I can't answer. But I think we, there, there is another a really big, so there was a structural problem that we will all have to work with if we make this sort of content. But the other problem that we have is, is how do we distribute and how do we draw attention to the fact that this is out there? Obviously, with traditional television, you have a schedule, you put it on and so on. But um, I know that of other projects who nearly had the same of the production budget again as PR money, um, because you have to alert people to the fact that, that your, your project exists. And I, I think that's a really big, um, uh, that's something to think about, and I don't think we thought about that enough. And so, for example, what we didn't, I think we got um, better distribution through social media, which was a, a goal, but it's been sitting on the Al Jazeera website on and off. Um, and, and it's interesting, so it was easier to get people to come to, it was easier to get people to come to our um, project via social media um, than it was people clicking it when there were people on the Al Jazeera website. So, was that clear? Um, yeah, I mean, so, so you didn't have news, people browsing the news and then going, oh, let me check out pirate fishing. That didn't happen as much as we thought. From my point of view, the problem is that, um, um, as I told before, the design is made that you understand the story without watching the video. Uh, and that runs against watching the videos. So I would say uh, that, um, as I told before, um, if I would do this again, I would try to keep the video shorter mm. because they should not interrupt your flow of yeah. using the web documentary. That is actually the problem, in my opinion, of the not so small visualizations. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is really that less is more yeah. in these less things, right? More, you really yeah. want to yeah. pare it down to the minimum you because have. If, if you don't watch the video, you don't, don't get the clue in order to go on. So, so but you can, read, you can read the clue, and uh, I think you get the story uh, even if you don't watch the video, too. Uh, I think we're running really low on time. If there's one more question, we can, we can get it in. Hello, my name is Taeyong Kim. Uh, I came from South Korea. It's a wonderful story, wonderful interactive story. Uh, you know, can you game, can you play the game, the sound or music is very important. Uh, so I'd like to know uh, how uh, could you make the sound or music uh, when you made the uh, pirate fishing uh, so, personally, uh, I work at the work at the data journalism team, and so I used to make uh, some kind of interactive uh, graph. But uh, whenever I made the interactive graph, sometimes I feel it difficult to make a sound or music. And so, uh, please uh, share your experience. Um, well, I'm very, very happy about the work we did on music. Uh, I have to, to say a lot of thanks to our um, uh, music man that makes everything from the editing, from the editing of uh, audio on clips. Uh, he produces the original music that is uh, in uh, the clips and into the website of um, Pet Fishing. And uh, its its name is Ricardo Cocotz and um, it's a really good professional, and um, he, w he worked this way. Uh, I asked him to uh, watch the, the film by Giuliana and to uh, study the, the problem of pilot fishing in Sierra Leone and to, uh, to listen to some music from Sierra Leone and to understand their instrument and then to compose, compose music that was uh, narrative music into the clip and environmental music. So non-narrative music for the website. And uh, it is, he also made an album based on this work. Uh, so he did a, a good job, in my opinion. I thought he did a great job. <laughs> uh, and so did you on this panel. So uh, thank you very much for being a great audience. Thank you for being a great <laughs> panel. And uh, I think everybody should go have lunch. Thank you. <laughs>